Let's call it. Call meeting order at 901. Eric, can you do a roll call, please? Captain Yes. Arlene Sortman. Here. Josh Stransky. Present. Jerry Snow. Here. Jenna Reed. Here. Glenn Pepper. Here. And then staff, we have Molly O'Donnell. Here. Uh, Lauren Sully. Here. Kendra Daniels. And. Oh, sorry, here. And Sarah Arnie. <laughs> here. <laughs> All right, so first on the agenda is approval of the minutes from our May 14, 2024 meeting. Do I have a motion? Do I have a motion from the room? Uh, second? Second. Second. All right. Any discussion on this? Oh, I just wanted to mention one thing since I wasn't here. I'm excited to see that the early childhood education is fully funded for, yeah, because that can really get something that I so thank you all for that. Any other discussion? All right. Let's vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Motion passes. All right. Number three, public invited to be heard. So we do have some members of the public online. But are you, Ali, or I see you're the only one I see. Are you planning on speaking at public invited to be heard or just listening? No, please listen. Okay. I don't think I had a single. Okay. Let me check. <laughs> All right. We'll go to number four: organizational updates, advisory board interview update. All right. So, um, Jenna and Arlene completed the interview. So, thank you both for volunteering to do that. Um, you saw my email go around asking for a quick vote of the rest of the group. Carrie and Glenn, you were not on that since you guys were participating. Um, uh, just to confirm that the recommendation that the interview panel made was to fill three of the four seats. So if you recall, we've got four seats available. One is the rest of Lauren's term, which expires next June. Um, and then the other three are three-year terms, so they would kick in this year and be done in 2027. Um, the recommendation made by the interview panel was to not fill that one-year term and wait until June 2025 to fill that seat with a three-year. Um, if you guys want to say why or anything like that, you can, or this group all at least the group that um, I asked for the vote, which is what the clerk, clerk wanted for the recommendation to the LHG board, it, it's, it's done. So, um, so the LHG board will uh, interview all of the the uh, candidates except for Glenn and Perry on Saturday. They decided they didn't need to interview existing board seats, um, and your recommendation will be sent up to them as well. So we should know. Uh, on the June 25th City Council meeting, they'll adjourn uh, City Council, come in as LHA board, and make the appointments. And then that means the July meeting will be uh, welcoming new members, depending on what the council chooses to do with LHA board. Um, and so, and then this is Tom Flaskini. So we also wanted to give him a big thank you. We don't have your, your um, parting gift prepared. We will get it to you though. <laughs> but I want you to know that it's fully intended and we are very much sad to see you go. Very much. That was it for that. Alright, let's go on to number five development and project updates. Um, okay, I think I'll keep this brief today. We're in full swing um, to get a sent to closing, which we're going to talk about later, so I won't mention that too much now. Um, we are, uh, Village is moving a lot on construction. They're preparing to begin outdoor work soon. The parking lot was going to start in July. It's now going to start in August, but we also confirmed that that's not going to conflict with the Kaufman Street work, so we're still good there. Um, they've started roof work. Um, they're about to, they're going to be opening, reopening the first floor lobby soon, which is going to be great. At least the, the ramp access and the atrium piece. Um, so everyone, all the, the residents on site are being real troopers right now. They're still in heavy construction. They still have two of their three common areas um, in work. Thank you. 
in the works. Um, we're going to be wrapping up the fourth wing of units next week and doing a punch list walk, and then they'll be moving in after that. So we're up to the third floor and starting the end of June, um, which is our last two wings of units at least. So we're almost through the, the actual tenant unit work. Um, other than that, I'm just excited to see we're getting some siding options. We're doing a siding walk on <coughs> Thursday. Um, we've got brick stain samples up there, so I highly do recommend who I did this look. Um, and so you'll start to see major changes just from when you drop walk or drive by pretty soon. So it's exciting. Um, and we continue to hold those monthly coffee and conversations. They're just they're not just construction related. We have a couple of other uh, people coming in to chat, but primarily we'll have the construction team there for everyone through the end. So the next one is this coming Monday. Any questions about the lunch? What's going on there? Um, otherwise, we are really between those two projects, Ascent and, and Village, are very time consuming for Katie Pung, our development project manager. And then um, we are hitting the first, so this was our wave. We had Christmas 2, um, that was in June 2022. In May 2023, we had Zinnia close, Village closed in December 23. We got Ascent here in July. So we're on an every, between six, I mean, we have one year break and otherwise six months, we're on a big wave. And so Christmas too, we just had the, um, that grand opening occurred last week. Um, they're leasing up that final building and they'll get a release on all of their permits here in the next month or so. So it is up and running. Um, we didn't have to participate in that operational lease up since MGL, the developer, uses Silva Markham until the transition happens, which wouldn't be until about 2028. Um, but we are participating heavily in the lease up for Zinnia, which has been, it's, it's a big deal to, to work on that. There's a lot of moving pieces and um, we've been doing, uh, working with elements, permanent supportive housing consultant to do um, teamwork and training sessions to make sure everyone uh, between us, Element, Boulder Shelter, who's doing the referrals uh, for those exiting homelessness and the supportive services once they're there, and MHP, who administers all the vouchers there, between all of the parties, make sure we're on the same page. We're going to dig into tenant selection plans a little bit later. You'll get a taste for how that comes together. Um, so that once we are, when we're participating in lease up, which we will be for all the projects going forward, we're either an owner or a contracted um, property manager, it is a big lift as well. It's a different team, it transitions kind of to a different team with, um, but still the, the web still reaches out towards Katie and everybody on the redevelopment side. So anyways, that's where we are. We're looking at our pipeline for the next coming years, knowing that Village and Ascent are pretty all-consuming for a little while. Uh, but checking things out, we'll keep you updated as we have things come together. And that's it for development of project updates, unless anyone wants to ask about anything. Uh, item number six, items for input for the LHA Board of Commissioners. A is ascent by over crossing closing resolution. Okay, so let's stick into ascent a little bit. We don't have the actual closing resolution here. It's still being finalized by the attorneys, but it should be ready by the end of this week because it's going to be going to the LHA Board on Tuesday. Um, the goal is to close in mid-July. Um, that is a really critical deadline for Penrose. Uh, because if they do not close by July, it kind of hamstrings them on other projects for the next year based on CHAPA restrictions on how often you can qualify for tax credits uh, with what you have in your hopper already. But what we're going to be doing um, is this closing resolution will accept all of the funding that the project has received, all the gap funding, and loan that into the deal. So just to go over all those sources off the top of my head, we've got city ARPA funds, City ARPA interest funds, um, which are really dedicated for the ECE, Worthy Cause, uh, Boulder County Sustainability Funds, Colorado Health Foundation, and City Affordable Housing Fund. Look, um, all of those sources are going in and will all be 
uh, summarized in this closing resolution. It is, there are hiccups at the end, which is always happens in some way or shape or form. And this go around, um, we've had some great wins, which is the sustainability funds, the agreement is, is finalized and everyone is comfortable and it's pretty straightforward. That's for $300,000. The Worthy Cause funds, it's only $150,000, but it's, um, Worthy Cause has a lot of terms associated with it that include a right of first refusal and a covenant, which don't necessarily mesh super well with the other restrictions we already have from the other funding. Um, so we negotiated with them and they've accepted the terms to eliminate those items so that we really have it, um, the, covenants and uh, the road first situations that we've already negotiated aren't at risk. And then the tough one is Colorado Health Foundation. Um, it's $2 million. It's absolutely critical to the project. Um, it comes in as a, it's a revocable grant. So it's not a loan, it's a grant. But if we don't meet certain performance milestones in the first five years, they could pull the money back. The challenge with doing an ECE with affordable housing is that, uh, you know, Penrose is the 80% the general partner, and we have to take on guarantees, and the guarantees associated with this $2 million are that our future ECE operator, which is Wild Plum, we've got an MOU in place with Wild Plum, and they've gone to their board, and it, it's there we go, there we go. Um, certainly need more funding to get the building equipped, but that's still to come. Um, but because the developer has to guarantee the performance of the ECE, which really, you know, Pedro's does not have control over whether the ECE is filling uh, daycare spots. There is an inherent conflict there that we're working through. We're talking to the Colorado Health Foundation all this week. It's a real hot topic at the moment. Um, to try and get it all resolved so that the investors and the general partner can be comfortable with taking on that as a guarantee when they have a lot less control over what happens there. This is a standard challenge, I'd say, with putting a, a non-affordable housing use on an affordable housing deal. Um, I have confidence that we'll get there because uh, we really just really, really need it all to come together and want this ECE to be included and not, the risk is so low. So we're trying to just get everyone comfortable and maybe put in some cure rights, which the Health Foundation seems um, amenable to so far to get everyone comfortable. So that is a very hot topic this week. We might not have resolution on that by Tuesday's board meeting. We might have to come back with an additional resolution later to solidify that piece. Um, but. Everything else is ready to rock. Are you talking about just putting the city as a backstop? I I think that we should chat about that because I was wondering, we, we you and I and Christina all meet Thursday morning, and I was going to try to discuss that. Like, what other backstops might be out there? So let's chat so about that. There's a lot. I mean, I'm not really worried about it in terms of um, what's it called? What are they called? Web platform. Uh -huh. Well, um, because if needed, I could go to TLC. If needed, I could go to FFN, or even the city could oh, be the yeah. next stop. So I wouldn't sweat that too much. You know. <clears throat> we're talking. We're having a ton of conversations in the next three days to get everybody just talk through what the rest <coughs> really looks like. I would just say the city, well. <laughs> the city would commit to fill to backfill with the appropriate organization and okay. put that in a contract. Okay. Include that in our conference next one, which I think is tomorrow afternoon. Anyways. And, and Colorado Health Foundations, their requirements are pretty minimal. I mean, it's you do the normal operations, you're going to be meeting yes. their minimum requirements. The minimum requirements are really related to you will uh, attempt to fill at least 12 of these spots with on site people, families okay. over a period of time. And we put in like some um, qualifiers there that if they don't, you know, we're doing all the outreach, if they don't participate, we can't force them to, but we're building in a lot of that type of uh, qualifiers there, but they are really not, they're not heavy lifts. It's just, what if 
something dr crazy happens. That's the only, that's why the, the risk is generally low. But getting investors, they always want, and their attorneys always want those things covered too. Sure. So, any questions about the set? Otherwise, we'll be talking about it Tuesday night. Go on to Zinnia Suites and LHA General Tenant Selection Plans? Yes. So, we've been having doing a lot of work on this lately, and I wanted to make sure this advisory board understands how these all piece together. And uh, we're going to talk about this with the LHA board on Tuesday as well. So, the broad difference is LHA is not in the ownership structure for Zinnia. We are a a third party property manager. So we participate in the tenant selection process and we manage the tenants, but ultimately the owner has the final say within the bounds of what the funding requires for the project. So for Zinnia, the tenant selection plan is finalized. Uh, DOH is the main approver of that and they have done that. We are trying to negotiate one last piece which I'll dig into, but um, we might do an amended tenant selection plan later to address that, but generally the Zinnia one is what it is. So we're not taking that to the board for approval. But we wanted to, the Zinnia, I'm sorry, the Suites tenant selection plan, we wanted to relook at that since we went through the Zinnia process, saw what DOH is looking for in a more modern, permanent supportive housing location, make sure it is, has been updated to reflect the HUD requirements that have changed um, over time, and really made it, we needed to make it much more clear because MHP and LHA need something to guide us that makes us all on the same page. Before, the Suites Tenant Selection Plan was primarily for MHP and anything LHA, it just referred to the LHA General Tenant Selection Plan, which is not really how we actually in practice look at permanent supportive housing when we're bringing in tenants. Um, so we wanted to do kind of a scrub on the suites one to make sure it's up to snuff. It's, it's old, it was an old document. Um, and then the LHA General Tenant Selection Plan also does need LHA board approval. That one we just updated to make sure the suites was pulled out so it had its own, so it's very clear, and updated a couple of things based on new HUD regulations. Um, so, overall, Zinnia is what it is. I would say the structure of Zinnia and suites is very important to the tenant selection plans. The suites is 100% project-based vouchers. So these are HUD vouchers, federally assisted housing. They have a higher level of um, requirements attached. Half and half. Half of those vouchers, approximately uh, 41, LHA manages. So LHA uses our, our suites wait list to fill those units. There are still requirements uh, related to ensure they are coming from homelessness and some other factors, but generally LHA manages that. 40 vouchers at the suites are managed by MHP. And those, they still have their federal project-based vouchers, but also MHP is the agent for voucher administration for DOH. So DOH has plays a role in those 40. At Zinnia, oh, and one of the major reasons to update the suites, TSP and what really with impetus for looking at it closer altogether, was that in February, DOH approved the suites moving from a combination, at least the 40 MHP vouchers, I should say, moving from a combination of local case conferencing, so using uh, Boulder County's housing solutions for Boulder County's uh, uh, wait list, basically. It's not a wait list, but it's their referral process for those exiting homelessness that are local. And then a portion of those were from, and this was a requirement of DOH funding, from the what's called the one home list. This is through um, MPHI, Metro, Metro Denver Housing Initiative. So this is, you just consider it a statewide list. So this is a statewide list of people exiting homelessness. So we could get somebody from Pueblo, which has happened, where they are coming up here because we are the ones with the permanent supportive housing unit available that DOH manages the voucher on. So 
in the past, we had this split at the suites. What DOH allowed us to do in February is transition to fully local case conferencing. And this is important for the suites because the suites was not purpose built PSH, it was a hotel conversion, so it was not built with trauma informed design. It was not the funding structure for the suites, it's from, I don't know, maybe 2005 or so. It's a, it was not, and this is DOH has said this as well, this is the general understanding. It, the structure of the suites was not set up for what would be called success today. It, the supportive services funding was not guaranteed and built in from the beginning. We've struggled with supportive services capacity there for years. We've been filling that need by going around the system and just doing it through the city because we knew the need was there, but the system didn't set up the funding for it. The suites was not is an old PSH that is not structured as they would in a modern day situation. So what that means is it would struggle and has struggled with higher acuity of need tenants. If we go to the local case conferencing only instead of the statewide list, that doesn't mean that necessarily we're not going to get high acuity of need people, but it does mean that we would get more people with local connections, maybe jobs already, family around, just the chances for having higher acuity of need people are lower in this way. And those people are not going to be served at the suites on paper like they would at a place like Zinia. Now we're doing that, we're bringing in clinicians, we're funding it ourselves because the system is not set up for it there. But generally the suites having a, attempting to get more lower acuity of need tenants is a benefit. Now, to balance that, anybody doing PSH knows that there's this, if you're getting DOH vouchers, there's a responsibility to bring people from the statewide list as well. So Zinnia, purpose-built PSH, supportive services are funded, the people doing referrals are also doing the supportive services, it's just much tighter on how it's put together. That project, we have 55 units. Um, Half of them are going to come from, the tenants are coming from that statewide list, half are still from local case conferencing. So we're still bringing folks from the statewide list to the site. They're just going to be at Zinnia, which is more properly structured to be able to handle that duty of pain. Yeah, the, the, big, the big reason when I met with the state when they said they moved everything into local case conferencing was because in general, um, when you look at it, the housing authority is probably putting, so if clinician one was fully loaded cost is about 120000 plus the security cost that we've had to put in there, which is another, Lauren, how much is that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Security. Security? Yeah. Security. Yeah, so over a hundred grand there. And then on the city side, we're putting in about at least another 280,000 um, with the two clinicians that we're bringing in out of the marijuana funding. And then on top of that, the support that we get from the legal court. So we're over a half a million dollars of support just to try to manage uh, from the city side. Um, and assist the individuals that are at the location. So it was really at that point when the state was like, you know, yeah, I hear it, but they're putting the money in. Let's change their mind. And, uh, you know, it's a big deal because at the same time, you know, we've historically dealt with, it's not just about the individual, it's about all the other individuals that live in the unit too. Um, and it is not uncommon for us to see situations that develop with singular individual ends up spending multiple individuals and, and then we're having to, to manage that situation. And so it's, it's at the end of the day, it's, it's A, about the entire living environment and so that's kind of the tag we took with them. And, and you know, part of it, you know, as I talked to Molly is, it, you know, I think a lot of times people get focused on the individual in question and we lose sight of the remaining people that live 
in the facility and the struggles that, that they're having. So I think we've tried to take a broader view to balance the individual with the overall living condition. Um, and, and when necessary, we take the appropriate action, which, you know, at the end of the day, our goal is to keep people housed, but not at the expense of everyone else. And unfortunately, when that happens, then that eviction gets on the record. And the long term issues are even more significant. So, so just to, to, to that point, because I think these are tenant selection plans, so this is only considered when somebody's being cons uh, has applied for tenancy, and we're going to approve or, or disapprove. Once they're in, this stuff is is no longer applicable. It's a different. It's about our housing retention plan and, and other things. Um, so, bottom line, Zinnia has a lower barrier to entry. That was a requirement of those DOH vouchers. Uh, Suites has a, a higher barrier because there are federal funding in this in the that site Zinnia does not have that um so i just want to kind of outline the differences between all of them and how what that really means in operations when we're working with all the partners to select people i'll also say i had a conversation with heidi over at the boulder county she's doing managing the um the local case conferencing list for zinnia and she participates on the suites too and she is really being very thoughtful about the list for Zinnia and who rises to the top of the list for a referral to Zinnia. Um, she's thinking about, she's running age data. She's trying to make sure that the community that they bring in can gel as much as you can figure out from their, their information that they provide, that it's on paper, you know? Um, but she really was being thoughtful, just trying to get I mean, there are so many on the list that, that you could work in a bunch of different ways. But she's generally bringing in similar age group, and it's generally looking older. I think the average age is in the 50s of at least the top candidates. Uh, trying to just make sure that it, it seems like a cohesive community as much as you can plan for it at the front end. Um, I was, I, I, it gave me some comfort knowing that they were being very thoughtful about that list. And it's on both sides because you have the HP and the Yes. So okay. Boulder Shelter is officially responsible for the referrals. Yeah. So they are the first working with HSBC, they're the first. Then um, we come in second, this is all for Zinnia to so prepare for this lease of a 55 units. We come in next and do run background checks first because if they're not going to pass that it's no sense in sending them over to MHP because MHP's barrier to entry because of the DOH rule are so low that ours is higher. So let's do ours first um, and then only send people to that third step if they're going to make it through, through our threshold. So we've been doing a lot of work. We meet weekly to just go over process and get on the same page about every piece of it. The lease, the application, obviously the tenant selection plan. We're going to get an MOU in place. So we're trying to be as piece of a team as we can. Where, where do appeals go? Because I saw that in the selection mm -hmm. process. Does that go to the upper level? Um, to so we, and uh, representatives from each, okay. but it has to be somebody that wasn't involved in the original selection. So we, we talked about that just last week, but who would that actually be? So who's going to work on the application side and the referral, and then who's going to be reserved for the appeal side? I'm not sure. So she's got um, data on the people on the, the local case conferencing list, age, uh, background, where they, you know, what, what, where they're from. Demographics. Yes, general demographics. And she's based on research out there about, um, you know, when you're getting your group of people together that are either. You know, she has history in um, those being ex exiting the prison system and how you do, if you're doing a like group home, then how do you mix that group up to make sure that they can be cohesive. There's a lot of research behind doing this type of thing. Um, so she was leaning towards um, groups of people in their 50s or above because generally the um, 
number of incidences, challenges that they have, if it's drug related or something else decreases, it's not always, it's not gone. It certainly decreases. She's, when you're bringing in 55 people all together that are exiting homelessness, trying to be thoughtful about what people you put in that building together is a different thought process than if you're doing a scattered site, a single unit, here and a single unit there. If you're bringing 55 people together, there is a thought process involved to try and make that um, a cohesive community as possible. City Hall. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, that was in City Hall. But then aren't, aren't half of them from MHP and half from Boulder Shelter? Or is it? They're all going through Boulder Shelter. Okay. They're all also going through MHP. Okay. But they'll, half of them will come from the Boulder County local case conferencing list, and half of them will come from the DOH statewide list. So, that stuff that we talked about, previous and current drug use may not be stuff like that. Yep. When we're talking about current drug use, that's the primary job, the damage to be done. Right. This is the, this is the tough part about permanent supportive housing. So first of all, we cannot, for under fair housing, we use very specific parameters in a tenant selection plan, and it has to be based on their convictions within the last five years. Many might receive tickets for possession, but they might <coughs> get convictions. And all of this is only what can show up on a background check. Somebody might be a user, but it's done not on a background check. And we cannot screen for that before we bring them in. Now, once they're in, if there are problems related to drugs that can affect the health or safety of the building or of the tenants, that's when we go through a different process. But housing first principles are, it's supposed to be a lower barrier. People are always going to come in I shouldn't say every person, but there will always be instances where people are coming in that struggle with substance abuse, struggle with mental health challenges. That is expected, and if, but for PSH, where would they go? So when you add in the layers of federal funding, and um, yes, when permanent supportive housing is funded by low income housing tax credits, you have investors that expect the property to perform or else they don't get their tax credits. And then if that becomes, if that snowballs, then that could jeopardize the tax credit program and or turn away investors from wanting to do this. So there's a fine line once a tenant is in how you handle meth specifically because that is what affects the investment relationship, the tax credits, um, and the health of the neighbors. So I don't want to take a time to wrap up here. If they can't use meth in the apartment, they're current drug users, they can't use meth in the apartment. And they can't use meth in the car. Yep. Where can they use that? That is the, the challenge thing. of the entire world of housing, mm -hmm. is what do you do? There is there is no, in PSH, um, there is no slam dunk win-win. There is challenges all over the place. Things conflict with each other, like investors and high acuity of need people, sometimes that's a conflict. That doesn't work when you have somebody that is a meth user, but doesn't have anywhere to actually use it. Because it's illegal to use it in public. It's illegal to use it, well, it my, is an, an my, offense to use it in our, on our properties. Honestly, my, my message to folks when we can have these discussions, I mean, I'm, I'm about protecting the property, maybe risk outside. I mean, but they're not going to do that. They want to be hidden when they, you know. So, but I seriously say that. Go take your risk outside. I think if somebody could solve that question for us, then the world's U.S. problems around drug substance abuse would be solved. <laughs> Just as it is so so challenging to walk this line, and it's very easy for the line to tip one way or the other when you're working with people. Um, well, and part of the challenge is this new, this lawsuit that a landlord can be held liable for not uh, 
not cleaning up her property and handling lead issues in their unit, and the other people were making complaints and had documentation of getting sick, and landlord lost. And so, you know, that case is out there, and while I think it may have been related to cooking that, I'm not sure. I think it was long-term use. Oh, so if it was long-term use, you know, that's a different thing that landlords have to be cognizant of in terms of how they're dealing with individuals because uh, that, not only that case has been healed, or if it has. That was in Lakewood. Yeah, that was in Lakewood. It was, it's a Colorado case, so it's a Colorado court seeking it. So the die's already been cast on uh, liability related landlord liability related to that. And um, unless that case is overturned, I mean, our world is now pretty clear. Does the landlord have liability insurance that covers that? Nope. No such thing as insurance that will cover meth remediation. So the point is, is if, if you don't know about it, you're not liable. But the case really was broken down on the fact that the mother and the daughter were getting sick and they continued to tell the landlord, hey, they're doing meth and we're getting sick and the landlord failed to act. And so then that's when the liability crept in. Um, and talking to Dan you know, from New Zealand, employment liability workers comp start sliding in is if you're employed but this happened in Michigan or Maine Some, yeah. where Somewhere. there was a it was a I think a nurse practitioner or something in an office adjacent to units where they were smoking and that person started having effects related to it and so then from an employment standpoint if they tell you that this is going on and it's impacting then that becomes a workers' comp liability, and then you also have the same liability if you fail to remedy the issue that your employees it's a safety issue. Um, and so, you know, the world, at least in this, that case is pretty significant, and people aren't talking about it, but I think people should be paying attention to it. Um, and so for us, <clears throat> you know, anytime in police, when they go in, to deal with an issue and they walk into a place where people are bad <coughs> or whatever it is, um, they have to file a well, it's an in-house it's, an in -house, it's an exposure report that we use because then that is connected into our workers' comp because if we have other issues. And so those are things that we need to now start being mindful of on our side as staff is going in. Um, and that just just literally started. I mean, yeah. We've been going into these houses for years, so but now we know there's more yeah. documentation that it causes it causes health problems. Does that notification go to the landlord too, property owner? When if, if you were to go into a let's say that there was an incident, you had to go into a home that renters were in. Yeah. You have to fill out the form for the employee side, but does it go to the landlord? So. If you're working with me, absolutely, but... Um, if you're in the crime-free multifamily housing program, I think the answer is yes, because that's part of the program. If you're not in the crime-free program, the answer is no, it's, it's a, because it, there's... If an officer isn't required, mm -hmm. I mean, if they see... It, let's just say this. If they're doing their due diligence, I would say yes. You know, they, they took the time out, they know it's a rental. A lot of times we go to places, we don't know if it's a rental or it's sure. single thing, right? So, and that's not really something, like when I go to a call, that's something I ask because it can take you down different paths, but I'd say generally no. So Molly, so let me see if I understand this correctly. We cannot check for meth at the time that the person applies. We put if there's a conviction on their record, then we can be yeah. okay. But if they move in and start using meth, then that kind of sets us up for a Yes, we don't have any meth testing or you know there's no way to um, confirm whether someone is a user. And if, if they are a user, 
that Peoria Board of Housing is supposed to accept people that are experienced substance, experiencing substance abuse. And then we bring in things like services, like Recovery Cafe, that we are bringing on site to help with that. But there is no stop gap there for being a tenant. Okay. And the likelihood of conviction is for low. that is very low. And now the possession of meth is a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a ticket. So everyone's hands are kind of tight. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Are you going to be putting the detectors in Samuel, before you release them? So that is, we're talking to Element about that. They are speaking to their lawyers about what their liability is, which is something we went through that exercise too, like a year ago when we were talking about doing these. So we're still in talks about that. It's they're the owner. We would love to include that there, um, but it's, it, it is their policy. It's a, yeah, so they're the owner and we're the contracted manager. So when you're looking at the long-term cost and exposure, the housing authority doesn't necessarily have that on Tenia because we're not the owner, they're the owner. So, so for us, we can encourage it because we do know that from a, a value add, you know, a cleanup is $8,000. We were doing the math yesterday on what's the cost of the unit and the annual operating cost versus the unit just to clean up. And I think the ROI that I figured out in 26 years of kind of or something like that, how you do it. So that's their call. You know, and that's the piece that we all have to be cognizant of is that if people start complaining to us as managers of the property about, hey, somebody's doing this or somebody's doing this, or we're getting sick, our, our obligation is to tell the owner, hey, this is what they're saying, this is what they need to do, blah, blah, blah. But then if the owner doesn't choose to do anything, we have to document it, you know, to a T, so that then if something ever came out of it from a legal standpoint, they're responsible for us. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, which is easy enough. I mean, we could just say, hey, we've informed you that here's a complaint, here's our recommended course of action. You know, waiting to hear from you, and if they choose not to do it, then we've <coughs> handled our obligation as the manager, and we have placed the liability on the owner. What kind of obligation, though, is there from an occupancy perspective? And if there's too many units that are down because they have to be immediate, like, is that? That's the investor kind. Yeah. They can't get the, the tax money right and put us down. So on village, so on village, how are we ensuring that all of the places we're remodeling are mess free? So we are not. Because if we were taking out drywall, we're, so we are taking out flooring, windows, cabinets, counters, but we are not removing drywall. So we cannot certify that there has never been meth used in that building. So we will not be putting meth detectors in those units. We are only going to be putting meth detectors in units that we have certified that they have been cleaned and we can verify that they are meth free before the next person moves in. So that leaves the tenant then liable in case you guys find meth in there. In the yes, okay. yes. Really the intent is to be more preventative not to go after people, but if we are able to confirm, like you moved into a certified clean unit and now it's testing positive, we have a problem. So going back to Zinnia, are we as the uh, contracted managers, or well, it's just contracted managers or the owners, I think we touched on this a little bit last time, but talking with the security teams about like what their role is going to be in bringing things to you know, the attention of both. Or, yeah. yeah. Right now, just during the construction period, we're using the same security contractor, and that's the intent going forward. We just okay. kind of line out how the contract works, but uh, we will be using. Their, every intent is to have as much 
communication between the city of Tanzania as possible. We're going to have the community managers are going to cover both. So we'll have Jana and a new assistant community manager, which we're just getting ready to put an offer to right now. Okay, good. So the offer has been sent. So we'll be working for through um, uh, pre-employment screening for the next week or two. Um, so there'll be the same community managers, same maintenance, same security. The intent is to make it operate like the community. Services, like when we bring Recovery Cafe in, it's going to be for tenants of both properties. Right. So part of it is, associated with that, is that we just signed, and we signed it now, the camera contract that we've been waiting on. And so part of it, from a security standpoint, is the cameras that were funded out on the project that we're going to start putting in the property. <coughs> The security company will shift from actually patrolling it to monitoring the camera stores, which is a, like, should be a cost savings in and, and what we're doing. But, but at the same time, um, they do a really good job right now of uh, catching things that we never were catching. And, um, and so in, in many ways, it's, it's really worth, it's worth the cost that we're paying. And, and really want to shoot. So, so yes, and cameras will be part of it. I will also say while we're catching things in the units, you know, as I, as I look at the suites and, and just tenant issues over time, they're becoming more sporadic. The big issue in that location is probably more, it's not probably, Sarah and I talked about this, it's more like the street outside of the location and the influences to the location uh, in terms of the activities that we're trying, people are trying to do in the parking lot. And so that's where the cameras are going to be so important uh, in helping us manage that. You know? Because I think there's a lot of really negative influences that are on the periphery of the property that if allowed and they get in, and you've seen it happen, it creates problems. And the fuel to the north is, is a definite issue. Right. You, you're right. Just to so. confirm, the, the field on Sweets property below south of the ditch or across the ditch? Both sides. Both. Okay. So, but just let's, what's really great is that residents call me yeah. about it. So we get on it. And it's city property, so we can, you know, we can enforce you know, trespassing. You know, that brings up something that I've also been trying to, in, in our relationship building with the team, preparing for Zinnia, really trying to, um, there's a level of skepticism about public safety's involvement at the suites. And what we've been trying to convey and get on common ground about is Sarah doesn't come in and bring, in, bring down the hammer. Sarah has relationships with these residents. They call her on her personal cell phone? Never phone. No, work phone. Anyway, no. your cell phone. <laughs> 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 um, they call her when they are having struggles or concerns. Are the people that come in from public safety are court and lead. They are crisis management and um, uh, substance abuse specialists. There's this, there's there's potential for a vision of LHA and public safety's relationship as being this hammer. And it is really, really not. And that is something we're trying to educate people about all the way through because it is a partnership and it is for the benefit of those tenants. And I'd so say, I just wanna make sure we've been trying to make that extremely clear. Right, and I'd say 75% if not 80% of the time if we have a call there, we do our best to send for it. So, um, if they're available. If we don't have any oversight at all, we can look at what Denver had, right? I mean, murders and all And that's, you know, they just put all the people in the hotel and said, have fun, <laughs> right? And well, it never ends well. Right? There are, you know, frankly, there are stereotypes that in the country that people see when you're dealing with this type of stuff, and that is not us. So it's a message we're trying to get out there. Find common ground, 
understand what each other are seeing in the day to day. That's been really key to this whole team building process. So. I mean, there, well, there's a philosophical difference, and you know, so when we have co our core team primarily that leads in this. When others around us started creating those teams, they engaged us in conversations about, hey, do we want to work? How do we want to do this? We want to work together. Um, obviously, we were further along, and we we're like, hey, you know, it's actually going to delay us if you're going to slow us down in what we want to do. Boulder essentially said the same thing. But one of the key differences in that conversation is. I believe the county, they're just dispatching the commissions. And, you know, I was pretty clear with them and said, I'm not going to just dispatch a commission without a police officer because we've seen too many instances where that could have gone from south in a, in a really bad way um, because they needed that police officer there because it went from zero to 60 in terms of violence and, and other issues. And, you know, I've, and so there's a philosophical difference between how we're approaching this. I've seen multiple body cam videos and multiple videos of this core and the police are working together. And it's, it's literally, uh, the one that I saw at Silver Creek was really, I mean, it was really like, an, if you're a sports fan, it was like a well-orchestrated football play, or if you're a dance fan, it was like a well-orchestrated dance because you literally see the movement. And initially, the police officers are there trying to just push it to a certain area, but once everything appears to be safe, you saw the commission slide forward and the police officers slide back, and then you saw the conversations occurring. And so, it's different, and, but yeah, there's just some core philosophical differences, but um, and that was part of them, I'm like, yeah, we're not doing that, um, because we will send a police officer with our core team at all times, just because you never know when it can go bad. And that's that's some of the challenges that Molly's talking about, is there's, there's just philosophical differences. On the suite switching from the state uh, listing to the local listing, I mean, I know there's a need locally. It doesn't open us to any additional risk of having to fill it. It just incorporates no. uh, individuals in it that are locally tied. And, yeah. Okay. The list is clicked on. Yeah. 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 There's, there's always a right? Yeah. I think mean, if there's an advantage to this, yeah, actually, because they tend to, most of the individuals know our core team or they know we. Or they're interacting with both, or they're interacting with, you know, ours. I mean, there's a connection there that makes it easier to help individuals versus something that's fresh. And Most of our problems, I, I actually, as I'm thinking about this, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of the significant challenges that we've had that have really impacted. Uh, the, the entire facility have probably been people who have come in that didn't have uh, minus one that we knew about. The majority they didn't have local ties, and and that was the challenge I think that we saw. I can only think of our buddy is the one on the ground floor, but outside of that. I think most of the significant challenges have been people that have come in with no ties to the community. And I think that's the hard part of this. That the state doesn't realize is if you're just moving people around and you're moving them out of an area where they have some sense of support, you're, you're, unless you're moving them out, taking them into substance abuse or uh, rehab, and then locating them adjacent with the rehab, when you move them out of that world, you're displacing them from a support structure that exists. And I think that's that's lost in it. And we've even seen through our angel initiative, when we've sent people to rehab, many of them actually have chosen to stay where the, the rehab center is. And there's some really good stories of people that they end up working for. But they choose to stay there because they developed that support structure when they were in rehab and don't want to get far away from it. So, we'll see. 
when you take into consideration then the testimony of the club and what they really need to do is get them out of that environment. That's the point of you have to almost that's where I think what we've seen with the Angel Network is it works if you get them into a rehab facility and do that first. If you don't, they just find it the same environment and they just continue in that area. And I think that's the piece to this. You know, that's when you look at causal links and success stories, you've seen a lot of and our angel network has been working for how many years? Twelve two. It started like right after I got here. About ten years. So it's about ten years and, and you know, you, you can see it. Is that a long thing? Yeah, so if somebody is addicted to drugs, they can come in to the police department, ask for help. Um, the police department will then facilitate a placement in a drug rehabilitation facility. And and um, yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon to see it. Um, so yeah, that's the angel network that we have, and that's kind of some of the information they get that helps us evaluate broader strategies. But that's a missing piece. That's kind of why we were so. Um, that's why we were really on getting the recovery cafe to do something at the suites. At least in my mind, that was part of it because we know that is a significant part. Of it. Any additional questions on this? Uh, we'll just say this is managing PSH and all of the community pieces around it has been one of the most challenging things. It's rewarding as well. And it is it takes a lot, a big team, to make it happen and do it well. So, all right. On a number seven, resident quality of life, emergency preparedness or emergency procedures. Yep. So this one was suggested by Arlena Toms. Um, a month. It was ahead of the the May meeting. Um, we pulled the emergency procedures for LHA. I did not attach them because they are pitiful. Um, they're from 2011. They refer to a contracted property manager that's responsible for implementing it. Um, it does not have half of our properties because they were built since then. So those are going to need a leg up for sure. We need to update them. The only thing that was really current was the floor plans for the several buildings that were, um, that were in existence at the time. So those will need a good amount of work. I think that um, what we'll end up doing, we'll certainly update the list of properties included. We'll pull out anything that is still useful and then we'll pull out some um, best practices from other housing authorities and maybe engage the city's and emergency management team to see what resources they have. I will say we probably will pick this up once we have the regional property manager position filled. Um, so just for capacity but right now we know that the community managers do do um, have conversations with the residents we've got the emergency the evacuation routes posted and you know the basics are there on site um, and we have brought in who did we bring in do you remember Tracy and we don't have Tracy here we have certainly brought in some resources to do coffee and conversations in the past to talk about I think it was Be Ready Longmont did some initial I might be remembering this incorrectly maybe we plan to bring them in but we can certainly engage them to come and talk to residents I think during COVID we did um, talk to residents about you know emergency health and safety and supporting your neighbors during emergencies but certainly that is not you know the version or permanent use so I would like to hear if there's any wishes from this board for us to consider when we end up looking at that yes I, I am saying this and bringing it up but you know like active shooter stuff have you guys thought about addressing that I just think well like so at the R center I think we actually had the police department come I mean, it was a while ago right yeah. like a year ago and just say look you know we'd suggest X Y and Z in the case of this and 
again, nobody wants to bring it up, but I thought it was helpful. We, the city does do, um, what's the name of it? That there, it's on. Yeah, thank you. Standard response protocol training at the city. Let's see if they would be able to come around and do a miniature version. What do you do? Um, is there, are there like safe places for people to go in case of a weather emergency like if we were to get a tornado or something like that? Shelter in place? Yeah, I think it's the shelter in place would be educating residents on where in their unit to go. We don't necessarily yeah, have. About, okay, good. So I brought that up in coffee conversations when people like you know, talk about weather and tornadoes and so we can address that. That thing comes up once in a while. And, Talk about it. So I guess what concerns me is if you're on the third floor, <clears throat> and it takes off the roof from the third floor, you're pretty well gone. And yeah, I just wondered if there was somewhere, you know, like none of the private know there, no, there's any type of tornado shelter. You know, part of it is that if you're on the third floor, I mean, and, and I was actually thinking about this the other day. Um, first thing you do is you go to your bathroom um i would say if you're on the third floor some of the units you could go to the hallway but you know some of the hallways have windows so it's a little bit different and, and so i think we'll we need to work on that a little bit but you know at the end of the day i think the safest place for everyone's probably in their bathroom because it's an interior wall structure and um uh, that's probably the safest place to go. You know, generally, when we look at these issues, like, some of people have asked, well, do we have a list of, you know, who stays in their rooms or who doesn't stay in their rooms in case of a fire? The answer is no, we don't have a list and we don't want a list because unless people are communicating with us about their current conditions, the list becomes stale and it can become stale overnight. And so it's easier for us to tell them, and this is what Sarah's working on with Michelle Goldman, is to, you know, if, if, you're, if you can't use the stairs, stay in your unit, because we train our firefighters in a situation to go in and first thing they do is start checking. And if you have a list, you're more apt to not to miss someone because well, they're not on the list. So, so we just tell them to stay. If it's not a list, they're going to check every year. <coughs> and then if, if you start thinking about other issues, I mean, you know, in terms of, you know, like when we had the flood, if we had a property in the flood, those are things from the emergency management side that we have in the system that we start understanding what's where and what do we need to do. So we would very quickly, in the event of a flood or something like that, understand we need to get transportation to this location um, and trying to get folks out. So during 2013, we knew Royal Mobile Home was, was an area. That was the first place that police and everybody started going to was Royal Mobile Home and St. Brain Mobile Home Park about evacuations and then looking and understanding what we needed from a transportation perspective. So every situation is different. Um, and in terms of safety plans for them, I think it would be what Sarah's talking to them about what do you do in inclement weather, what do you do in fire, and and then everything else is a little bit different in, in what we tell them. So for example, if we had a train derailment at um, 21st Street, what we communicate for people to do is gonna be based on what's actually in the train car. So, you know, it could, it could very well be we're communicating a shelter in place because if there's a chemical in the train car that um, is lighter than air, we don't want it going out. If there's a chemical that's heavier than air, then we're gonna be looking at different things based on what that situation is. So then if you, if you had an evacuation, you would just have a good day because we have um, that would actually be done through public safety and and the systems that we have in terms of communicating um, via either the, the tech system that we have or now with Boulder County we have the ability to do the geographic emergency alerts that start pinging your phone where it starts yelling at you similar to what you see on a, um, 
what is it, Sarah? Uh, Denver, 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 Denver. Denver. So, I mean, we, we that would not be a system, we wouldn't be using our system, we would be using public safety systems to do that. And Michelle and I went to all the communities last fall and talked about all of the same things. And I know that, and you guys are very good, and I know people just forget that the minute they walk out of the room, but yeah, you guys, you guys are good. All right, I've taken some notes. Any other items for us to consider when we pick that up? More to come on that one. So, eight uh, LHA report update on operations occupancy report. Sorry, I'm just letting chat to be creative. LinkedIn post for me. I love chat to If you haven't used it, it's amazing. <laughs> um, okay, so. I, I, this might be the last time we use this report. I kind of want to change it up because it, I don't like it. Um, <coughs> so we'll go through the occupancy report first. Happy to report we only have two active meth units, which is amazing. That's seven, oh. seven cleared in the last yes. month. Um, it's a work in progress. Obviously, you know how expensive it is to clean these units and get them turned around. The one at the suites was due to a recent eviction. Um, we just got that officially labeled as condemned so that we can hire a company to come and clean it out because they left their belongings and it's all meth infected. So we can't we can't do that eviction. That's right. It's six cleared in the last month, but we've had one new one. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're waiting on that. Uh, we have to, we're waiting on the quotes. Sarah's helping me um, because I have taken on all of the duties that Lisa had. So I'm very grateful to Sarah for taking over a lot of the that related work. Um, Aspen Meadows, the um, unit, the B2 unit, that's the one where we contracted with um, Habitat, Habitat to, to do some of the work at a reduced cost. And so we're, we're trying to work through how we're going to approach that because it's just drywall. We need cabinets appliances and all of that so that one has sort of um fell to the back burner as we're working on other things because we have to figure out how we're looking for that now on the suites unit are you going to have to go to the studs you don't know yet we can't we haven't even gotten the test yet oh i think we oh, we tested. just had tested oh, it well, yes, yes. well we is it that bad it's back the okay. h back is at 419. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of the highest uh, I've seen in an HVAC. So yeah, we we'll don't yet have the specific report from WeCycle that says what needs to go. Right. We're getting, we should actually have the bids uh, tomorrow. So it has not affected any of the side units or any of the other units that are close to it. Not that we know of, no. Well, they, didn't, they didn't test outside of the unit. They usually just test the inside. Sometimes it depends, <coughs> it depends on the levels by the door. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, as to whether they they go out into the hallway, and so I guess in this case they didn't tell us that they thought they would be. Let me um, let me confirm that real quick because I think I recall it. So this is going to be sort of a cost thing. And up there plus, yeah. The bathroom is high, the HVAC is high. We did test five foot east and west. Oh, they did. Mm -hmm. And the results were 0 0.05, so it's minor. And okay. 10 foot east west was 0.04, which is below the threshold of all. Okay. So it would just be minor. So we might have done So is he just doing it mostly all in there? And the bathroom? It's like, yeah. So, Martin, you said you couldn't do it. Could we can't go out, we can't go into the unit, and usually if we have an eviction and people leave their belongings, we as a team go in with gloves and plain clothes and we clean out the the um, belongings and put it on the curb. It's like it can stay there for 24 hours. That's what we're legally allowed to do for the sheriff's order. In this case, everything is, is effective with that, so we are teaching it. So we have to hire a company to come and do that clean out and dispose of it, seal it all in bags, and dispose of it according to the state standards. So we just did a rip for a lockout. Yeah, we changed the locks. So we've had one of these before. Um, and so what we had to do in that case is get a pod 
they then have to go into the pod and put plastic all over it. Then the qualified team goes in and they literally start wrapping all of the furniture and plastic and start placing it in the pod. And then you have to wait the 24 hours, but you have to lock the pod. Um, and then they come in and they dispose of all of it. Um, the situation was a little bit different uh, on the first time we did it. So they actually allowed, they put some of the clothes and stuff out there that could be cleaned. Um, but the furniture and everything that can go into to that. So yeah, it's a, it's a different piece. But yeah, we're not allowed to go in. You have to replace drywall. What about the insulation and drywall and the apartments that are next to it? Is it no crossover? It it rests on those surfaces and sinks into the surfaces. It's not necessarily kind of being like air through it. Um, it's more the it's residue covering the surface. So we have not had. I mean, we cycle wood. They come in once and certify that things are clean once we redone the work as well. And so they would tell us if the insulation was a concern, but that is not it. Well, most, most of what we hear when there's other units contaminated, actually it's a product of a shared uh, HVAC system. And so what happens is once it gets into that HVAC system, then it starts spreading it throughout the entire house. The suites does not share HVAC systems. I don't think we don't have that anywhere. They're yeah. all through wall or baseboard heat. Um, and so, but the, we have had one time where a resident that did have a meth unit had been visiting the next door neighbor and we did test down the hall and it tested inside that person's doorway. So it's going with the person. Do we have detectors and suites? No, I have units. So is there anything to be wondered about? The hallway down because we basically were getting uh, it was zero out. We weren't getting anything from it. So we, but we've had um, we've had the detector up in the hallway there in, in a few different locations. So not right now. Anymore. Is there anything to be learned about? where they need, you know, rearrangements or maybe increased number or anything to be taken from that one we did not get the detector. So it's actually, I had the detector next to that unit. And since the eviction is pretty much gone to a level that we're not concerned about. But it was spiking when, when he was there. And they're so sensitive that if it's on your person when you walk by, it'll pick it up. And so yeah, I mean, that's that's a unit that when we get it clean. Well, I'm just wondering if there's anything to learn about moving forward with the detectors. Like, should they be in a different spot? Should there be more of them? Should there be? I don't know. Because <laughs> you know the unit that was positive, right? You know where it was. And is there anything you can point to help you identify it faster? And, so. and that's why we put it there to determine you know, what, what we found in the unit, and, you know, after the, it was, so this person overdosed on fentanyl. And so that is how we learned that there were meth pipes in the unit. And that is how the eviction started. Um, knowing that was when we put the detector up, he's still there because the eviction kind of occurred. He didn't leave at that point. So that's what we started to, really get some data on, but it never really spiked that high, which was interesting. It, it, it showed about 50 or so, which is it, like he maybe walked by. He wasn't using right in front of the detector, right, in, in a common space. Or open the door and yeah. you know, things like that. So, I mean, yes, I mean, you, we could, theoretically approach it by putting it in the hallways. And there you're not looking for just a positive return, but you're looking for spikes mm -hmm. and, and to see what's what's happening. Um, 
Yeah. We just ordered one. Oh, we're going to order some, and we're going to put them in city bathrooms. We have one in one city bathroom right now. Yeah, that's better than I was thinking. But yeah, that's our goal. We, that was one that's clean. Mm -hmm. And so we're we're getting ready to start doing take the next step. It almost feels like if they're not in the units, you gotta have a ton of them to be affected. Yeah. Well, and here's the reality from an operational perspective. Um, meth is an issue in terms of the units and what everything we talked about. What what I'm more scared of is actually fentanyl. And and I, where I'm scared with fentanyl is for our maintenance staff and um, property managers when we do inspections and things like that because that doesn't take a lot to drop a person and so I know that the schedule and training on that with all the staff because we tend to every time we see that see fit off and uh, that's the scary part of it. <laughs> They're, they're exposed to and dealing with issues more akin to what our police department deals with on a regular basis. And that, you know, somebody goes, what keeps you up at night? That's what keeps me up at night because you don't know, you can't control it. And in the blink of an eye, if you drop someone, and, you know, we talked about, you know, when you go into humans, probably need to. So I do want to mention that we've had the fentanyl conversation with the Zinnia team, um, and it's in this draft, but we're still talking about it. Um, because this is just boggles my mind a little bit, but um, Boulder County Public Health has made a statement specific in regards to our discussions on tenant selection plan for Zinnia, that secondary exposure to fentanyl is not a high risk. And I just don't understand what planet we're living on when you read the news. But also, I Googled right away. I Googled, I'm touching fentanyl overdose, knowing that we've had a police officer go to the hospital for touching it in somebody's purse, unknowingly. Um, people have died. But you Google it. And there are reputable sources where it is fully one way and fully the other way, and it is infuriating. I don't know how people are navigating that right now, because really, if you Google that, there are universities that are saying that secondary exposure is not a risk. And maybe that you know there's these differences, whether it's still in pill form, or if it's in powder form, or if it's the foil from someone smoking it. It is, um, I was really surprised that we ended up struggling on this issue. But we did. Also, the it is possible to get a conviction for fentanyl, which is the only way we could really deny in a tenant selection plan, but it's extraordinarily rare. Mm -hmm. So um, it wouldn't, I mean, the chances that it even comes up as a question at this point at the tenant selection stage is low. But um, that is, there's something wrong. <laughs> There's something wrong with the research, or what is going on? How are they? How is this out there? But also, well, public health agencies are saying it's not a risk. Here's the problem um, with it, and Sarah can either corroborate it or not. But so I can get like a some. So you all know undergrad degrees in history. So when I start probing something, I start digging in. <coughs> The problem with fentanyl is that if you take it and you take it into university setting and you evaluate it, well, what are you evaluating and, and at what time? Because A, obviously the production of fentanyl is produced primarily via the cartels in Mexico and distributed to the north. In uh, China. In, in China, and there's an interesting guy that I've been listening to on podcast. His name is Mr. Pato, and he's the one that kind of was part of the group that broke Fast and Furious, and, and he's literally, as a reporter, gone in and reported fentanyl production facilities. And he talks about how 
uh, the Chinese are sending fentanyl, but they're not only sending fentanyl, they're sending chemists with them to teach people how to make it. But it's all about what happens in that particular mix and what they're putting in and how well it's mixed. And, and, and think about it like if you're baking at home and you're putting baking powder and all of the other stuff, if you don't mix it well, you can get really high concentrations of salt, sugar, whatever it is in the mix. But that's what this guy is saying. And that's why so many people are dying from this is because you could have a weak batch, you could have a strong batch. And it's, it's all dependent on what that person did that was making it somewhere else. And so to say secondary exposure is not a detriment, well, that may be because whatever they were testing, you know, they were using the precise measurements in the lab versus that's not the way it works in real life. And, and how we know that is that we know there's a strong batch out there when we start like to have like three or four overdoses in a day or a week. So we know that there's a strong batch out there. I mean, essentially killing people. Does Narcon uh, infect that? Narcan? Narcan? Yeah, we use it all the time. And it, it brings it out of it. It saved the residents' life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two parts. Staff and those carry back home and can use it? We have it on site and they are trained to use it. Yeah. It's a, in this case, public safety. Yeah, so they all right. I mean, the person who gets like that. Oh, that's right. The friend right. who was also with him. Yeah, so it's a hard topic, and, and Sarah's right, that's part of like the opioid settlement, so I'm on the opioid board. One of the things that we, we funded, and it was a bit of a battle to get it funded, was a device that we can have here so we can download phones immediately in those situations. And, and what you're trying to find is, is to connect to when you start seeing multiple overdoses in a short period of time, you're trying to figure out where is this coming from? Because it's a really strong batch that's made its way into, into the community. So you're getting more than housing stuff, but, <laughs> but I think that's the difference between us and these other housing authorities is the relationship that we're having here I think we're having a broader view of the world and what we're coming in with. And, and Molly said this when we were talking to the council about meth is, we're also going to, and, and this is my philosophy, and I think where, we're, where we are as an organization is, is you can't avoid these issues. Um, avoidance just lets the issue continue to percolate. Um, you know, you've got to just recognize it talk about it, deal with it. Because if we don't do that, we're gonna wake up one day and we're all gonna be sitting here going, there's no way to handle the situation in this housing units. And I mean, if you think about it, think about what would happen if we had to go in and clean 15 units at the suites. I mean, it would make our this in terms of how we were, we were going to handle this. The other side of this that I think people are, are missing in it is that the community is becoming more aware of this. Um, and we've even had residents in the suites that have done their own tests to see you know what's happening in their units. Um, it is not uncommon to see people who are moving into apartments get the kits and test the apartments that are moving in we're actually seeing people that are purchasing properties doing the same thing and and so you can't turn a blind eye to this because we know that people are educated and you know you can go on amazon and get a really good test it won't tell you what the numbers are but we've used it and we've now been able to correspond that to what we think the numbers are going to be on the test and and so pressures are also outward in terms of people living in, people who are moving in as well, but we can't afford to have these units vacant. And, and that's, I think, what's getting lost in the conversation. Okay. The mall is challenged. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but uh, that are more resistant to meth or not the, like services that don't absorb non porous. If it were cheap yeah. enough, we right. talked about yeah. if you take the drywall, you put stainless steel on the drywall, and then you texture the stainless steel where it looks like drywall. Then all you would have to do is literally scrape the texture off of it and cut, but you just it's, you can't afford to do that. I mean, but that's the solution. Or cabinets that are epoxy, you can just if it's an epoxy countertop, epoxy doesn't absorb it, so you could clean epoxy. So you know those are the things that you know that the cost is reason. Onto the non meth units. <laughs> um, so we have some vacants at every property. Um, you know, you can see where they are. Like in the suites, we have seven, but the majority of them are MHP. So we're waiting on MHP to give us clients. Um, Briarwood, we've got our four units that are vacant, and we're working through the wait list now with Diana. Um, applications have processed for a lot of them. We have a couple transfers at some of the properties. Um, so once that person transfers there, you will be taken legally ready. Um, but it's getting better. The village on Main, are we not leasing those units out until they're Yeah, we are. So now, the as the units clear, they're opened up for, they're available for lease. But we're not doing it until they are renovated. Yeah. So This one? Uh, so this is through six, seven. I put this together. Um, we don't have any current. We have one that went to court. They signed a stipulation, so they have until the end of this month to move out. That's what we're talking about. That's that's the only one that we're waiting on. We got our judgment, so the, they don't fulfill their end of the so stipulation. Okay. And that was a unique situation. Thanks. We try to work on getting people's resources first. This one was a, a project based voucher where the family was not in the right size unit and was no longer qualified for the project based voucher. And it had been over the 180 days of no half payment. And uh, we want to give the universe for the legal fees for that. It would get paid. So. Well, that's all. Yeah. yeah. So it's the question of is it worth the administrative work? We found a lot of ways it's not. And then for property updates, um, first one, if some of you may be aware, this might be news, um, but Lisa resigned from her position as regional property manager. Um, we appreciate all the time and effort she put into her role. Um, in the meantime, I picked up a lot of her duties. Some of them are just sitting there, <laughs> admittedly. Um, but that's uh, that's taking up a lot of time, um, and it's opened my eyes to a lot of things that we need to look for. You know, going forward, our right sizing, the job description, and the duties, and um, <clears throat> what can we just do to to shift? Anytime someone leaves, it's a great opportunity to talk to the entire organization and see what works, what doesn't, what's needed, and where can we shift. Um, we so have, the position isn't listed yet, right? You're still working on the job description now? Yeah. Yep. I've had meetings with um, all of our teams. The only person that I need to meet with is Leo, it's uh, senior services. And then um, we'll probably talk about it today at our staff meeting um, and then get that up and running. And then open until filled. I don't want to hire someone just to hire someone. It's better to hire someone who's great for the job. Um, Longmont Meals on Meals came to the properties in May, um, not at a coffee and conversations. They just had their own little pop up event where they brought food, got people signed up. Um, Center for People with Disabilities attended our June coffee, or going to attend a couple June coffee conversations that they missed in May when we were short staffed and just we had to cancel. Um, Cultivate is coming to all of our coffee and conversations this month, too. Um, this isn't on here, but we're going to have the security team come and do a presentation, just introduce themselves and the team at the suites uh, this, this week. Um, since they're there now all the time, we've got their 
dedicated officer, so they just want to make sure everyone feels comfortable, knows who they are, and have recognized them, ask questions. I've gotten a lot of questions about are they armed? Because they carry a taser that looks like a gun, but it's not a gun, it's just a taser. So things like that help people feel more comfortable. Um, we have a landscaping company, but they are completely behind on our sprinkler activation, so we've had a lot of complaints at the properties about dead grass, um, yellowing grass, and concerns about the gardens, and we're working on it as best we can. Um, we have them scheduled to come to, uh, I forget what it's called, but there's like some walkout on a backflow sprinkler thing at Spring Creek. I think it didn't get, um, at some point it didn't get an inspection, and so then the city locked it, so we have someone coming out from our um, contractor to come get that done. And then we're hand watering in the meantime, which is extra work, but it's it's cheaper to do that than to buy new stuff. Um, call Osra. Osra. Um, at Water Quality. Yeah. Or just send her teams and include me, because I think well, they just brought something where they can have their contractor come out and do it. Okay. And we're not waiting. Yeah, they're not coming to like the 15th. Yeah, so call her and then. Um, work with her and getting that resolved and then tested. I think that new company just got overwhelmed and Mel didn't have enough staff, but it's like too late to cancel a contract to get a new one because they're behind all the other clients. So, so question does this does this per, does this company come and turn on the sprinklers? They are at some properties. They've done an analysis at some of them that there's um, some repairs needed to the system. So we're working through the budget Kendra and I and Patrick are working on the budgets because we have savings with this um, contractor so we can actually pay for that repairs. Um, and so we just have to get that clear to get them out there and do some of repairs. I think it's just fall over in Spring Creek where the grass is really suffering. Village is yes. horrific. Well, village is, is village that's a, get that's all ripped out. It's the most ripped out. The the um flower bed and that little brick structure. Yeah, that's LDBA. Way. But we are in charge of turning the <laughs> We have the irrigation. We have the irrigation. They do the flowers, yeah. Yeah, they do that, but we have to get the water to them. So we did um, Patrick's been working on that in the absence of our contractor. So but the lockouts related to the back from the inspections. Just send that to Oscar and then I'll work with her to get it. Okay. Because I think once you agree to get it tested, then they'll turn it back over. Yep, they'll, come, they'll do it right then and there. They'll unlock yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so, dedicated security to suites. Um, property staff and Sarah and, and I receive the reports um, every day. Um, and then our team, our core and me team, work very closely with the security team. Um, Aspen Meadows, Summer, our assistant community manager, has been taking care of those two properties. Um, while we look for a new community manager, I think that that's getting posted today internally uh, to see if we have anyone who's interested. Um, and we're working on the next steps for flooring at AMSA. Molly got samples last week um, that we're reviewing. We're waiting for a proposal from the uh, general contractor in flooring. So <coughs> they're attempting to provide a proposal outside of insurance and legal action. So yeah. we'll see what that looks like. So the climate flooring is a good one for the nurse. Um, it's it's a it's a mix. So we would be um, pulling up. This is the proposal so far, but we have no idea. We're we're waiting to see what the actual where the dollars sit with it. But um, remove and pull up, and then re glue down in a standard installation the flooring that we have in certain areas, and then in some areas we would move to carpet tiles. And in some areas, like the UFAS units, kitchen and bath and hallway, that high traffic area, that's the sample we got for a heavy duty, um, it's a sheet vinyl, but it is is rated for heavy wheel use and it looks pretty great. So we're working with them right now to figure all that out. See what that proposal will look like when it comes in whole. Firewood. I put in a picture so you guys can see these beautiful, expensive programs that were installed. Um, and this is part of our our um, voluntary compliance agreement with HUD. Um, and then, like I said, all the units have been remediated and are ready to lease. The Village on Main, we're in phase four to move out to renovations. Um, they're actively working on lease up. 
Fall River and Spring Creek. We have our new team, John and Z, is the new uh, maintenance tech, and they're working together to get the units. We kind of, we have six vacancies between those two properties because we, after Greg left and we didn't have a dedicated uh, maintenance staff, those were not prioritized while we went for that. So now they're getting those ready to go. Um, Hearthstone and Lodge, we don't have any updates. And then Zinnia tenant selection is underway in Boulder Shelter for the Homeless in HP and LHA. Currently. Molly already talked about we're engaged in weekly meetings, trainings, and team building. Key work, team building. Um, construction completion is expected in September or early October. Um, the police up and movements following. They have a very aggressive schedule. So we've already been the tenant selection started last week. Yeah. We're looking at five tenants per week to fill spots. Um, Crispin too, we had a grand opening celebration last week, um, which was attended by Chapa, Division of Housing, RBC, LHA, the city, and NGO partners, as well as Santa Markham and Baltimore Mission Public. Um, we've got a community manager position, as I mentioned, internal for Aspen Meadows Senior Neighborhood. Um, two assistant manager positions I sent by conditional offers when we were starting this meeting. Um, and then the regional property manager position that we'll be reviewing and hopefully getting posted sometimes. Sometime. Any questions? Public health and safety update. Um, we pretty much touched on the cameras. We finally, um, I'm actually meeting with the gentleman this next week. He's actually not this week, this Thursday, um, regarding all the things we need and how we need to move forward with that. And it's a group, it's actually ADT, but they're not all that wrong. So we'll be working with them closely. Um, kind of touched on the metal detector piece. We're ordering 22s, some for city bathrooms, some for us to pick and choose where we want to put them. Um, I think the big thing for, for me right now, we are needing to get new background. We need, so, the one that we went with um, is actually local, uh, more local dish, Carvana. Um, they sold out to a company in California, and since we since that happened, we were beginning to see um, things not popping up at all. Um, and then we realized that after I got because it, it, it never it was never really brought to me until maybe some flags were raised to kind of do my back end work, but. Um, right now, um, since Lisa left, I'm, I'm working on that. Diana's running it through the company that we have right now, and then we're, we're doing our best to do the screen. So needless to say, doing my diligence and finding a, a good background company that's going to provide all of the things we need. Um, and you're pay a lot of times I'm seeing that people are, you know, landlords, property owners are paying for these backgrounds and they're not finding anything and a lot of that's due to state law many states won't release information and you can check the if it's an online company and check the out you know, check nationwide um, and they're not they're not actually doing it because you have to go to those municipalities to get the information because like Arizona Texas California Colorado they won't release the information so I'm I have a two week deadline, actually I have a week deadline, to find a good company. So um, I've been doing my research and so we'll continue to get that going. Um, and as far as resident issues, you know, if you, like we had talked about before, a few of the suites residents talking to me about, you know, some of the unhoused folks in the, in the property, um, really working with security on some of the resident issues that we're seeing at the suites. And, um, other than that, I mean, our senior properties have been very, very quiet. AMN's been quiet. So, it's been good. Any updates from the girls? Okay. Covered it all here when we were going, so. Yep. Right, anybody have any other business? All right. Once adjourned at 1040. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.